Hopefulness 2.0, day 23. Gotta cook me up some bacon. Gotta take care of this uh, pasta sauce that I haven't really done much of with words thing. Scrub out these pans because it looks like they've got. I don't know what the hell's going on with them. I think they may be rusted spots, which kind of sucks. Baking in the oven for like about an hour with uh, water in them. And then let them sit out. Apparently, when I let them sit out, they all just dried up. And it seems like they got rusted in the process, which is unfortunate. I thought they were solid aluminum. I didn't think they would be iron or steel or anything. But it's whatever. Yeah. Well, just... I realized I didn't have Beetlejuice in my library, so I rectified that. I'm gonna watch that later today. I'm gonna shower as well, because today is a shower day. And I'm gonna make a phone call to uh, Enterprise to see about um, renting a car tomorrow. Because every time I look online, try to, uh, to book a reservation. It always says it's sold out, like every day. It's weird. <laughs> and then like one point I was like, all right, what happens if I extend the rental time like four to four days instead of just two and then everything's fine. And I'm like, how does that make any sense? It's like, if I took the car the same day at the same time and returned it Two days later, it won't let me do it. It says it's sold out. But if I did it for four days, it's available? No, that doesn't make any sense. Um, unless they just don't do rentals for that short period of time, but it doesn't say anything like that on, on, on the site, so I'm like, I don't know what the hell. Not like there's really any flavor. It's whatever. But it's strange how the gas was pushing out against the flame, knocking it backwards, and it still wouldn't. <laughs> it's like, no, I will not light on fire. What the hell are you doing, bro? Anywho. 
So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch Beetlejuice again later today. I might rewatch Chappie, I'm not sure, but my reaction to Alita does not bode well for that one either. Because, I mean, they both start out so wholesome, heartwarming, and, and, it, and it's like, man, it just makes this drastic switch into, you know, and it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like a good story in that. It feels more like spectacle. Um, and I don't know what, I don't know what the studios want with regards to stories like that, where it's like, you know what I need to rewatch? I need to rewatch Short Circuit from back in the 80s. Is Johnny Five no disassemble and all that stuff? Yeah, there was a sequel to it, and my understanding of the sequel isn't that it's, that it's not as great, I don't know, but I need to rewatch the first one. That's what I need to do as well. So, I, you know what? I'm going to do that. I'm going to watch Beetlejuice again, because it still holds up, and get a better understanding of what the actual real story is and everything. Um, and then I'm going to need to watch Short Circuit, because I literally haven't seen that film since I was a kid. Um... <clears throat> And I feel that getting an understanding of an older film that was more centered around families, essentially, being the audience. Um, with regards to artificial intelligence and, and the like, and see how that plays out, might have a better understanding, a better foundation, if you will, of what it is I'm trying to look for, what I'm trying to find in these stories. <clears throat> And what it is that, with regards to find in these stories, and what is it about the stories that connects me or disconnects me to the artificial intelligence of the character? <clears throat> because a good story, especially one that ends up holding up and lasting, um, it has certain characteristics. <clears throat> Whereas a bad story or a lower quality story, if you will. Look, I'm not a film critic. I don't ever intend to be one. It's not a goal of mine in the future of any kind. Um, but trying to understand film, trying to understand story structure, these are things that I have found, for one reason or another, to be important to me. You know? You know, one of the reasons why I even took art classes in the first place, especially out here in, in California, was like, I wanted to have a better understanding of the thing, whether, as to whether I like it or not, you know? And, and that's just me as a person trying to learn. You know, it's like, I don't know why I like this thing. I want to know more. Or I don't know why I don't like this thing. I want to know more. I want to figure out what this, the thing is that I'm trying to understand. <clears throat> I 
And in so doing, you know, I, to what degree? I don't know. Does it matter in the end? I don't know. No, in the end, nothing matters. Um, but whether it's to have a conversation about this kind of stuff with people or if it's to even show off, I don't fucking know, really. Um, but, you know, it's like... When, when you like a flavor, it's, it's the same thing. If you can describe why you like it, you feel something different about it, you know? It feels more complete. The whole experience literally makes more sense to you when you understand it more fully. And movie, TVs, video games, etc., they all they all fall under the same umbrella of the type of entertainment that they are. And a lot of overlap is involved in the way that they're structured and in the way that they work and why they work. Oh, sure. TV and, and um, shit. I'm going to put the bacon in here. After it's done. The TV and, and, and movies are less interactive than video games. It's just kind of the nature of the beast, as it were. Um, <clears throat> fine. You know, they don't have to be um, interactive. They can be passive. There's nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> in so many ways it makes perfect sense um, you know sometimes you don't want to put in the effort you know to, to move to progress the story or to learn about this that you want it to just kind of happen um, and while that may be the nature of the media that you're consuming, it doesn't mean that you take the the humanity or the person totally out of the picture. You still want them, you want the characters to be relatable because if they are not, the person watching it doesn't care. It's like what I said yesterday about Alita. I didn't really pick up on what the biggest problem was until I was literally talking about it yesterday. I didn't care about her. I felt no sense of stakes. When one raises the stakes, it never felt like her objectives had any true obstacles. Going back to, you know, the foundations of acting, understanding the characters, understanding the motivations, as the average person likes to say. <clears throat> it never felt like she had to try. It never felt like she had to make an effort to get what she wanted. It was either it came to her just after learning about it, or 
she basically just intimidated people to get what she wanted with and then like through said intimidation it it wasn't even a lot it was just one singular moment there wasn't any real true pushback and here's another thing that happens when it comes to conflicts and obstacles often the obstacle itself <clears throat> often the obstacle itself pushes the story forward um, you know her wanting to become a hunter killer or whatever the hell they're called um, hunter warrior bounty hunter basically like yeah she she wanted to become one and her father figures like no and so she just goes and does it but like it's not like when she went to go do it there was some other thing that got in her way like it would have made more sense in my mind that when she attempted to go become the hunter warrior that she had to have like a sponsor or something that would have caused her to go back to him to have a you know a heart to heart conversation about why she's doing this to really truly flesh out her desire for this and to also convince him that it was a good idea for her to do so that would have made more sense i'm getting tingles thinking about it um <clears throat> it would have it would have reinforced the relationship in a more at least seemingly natural way like the way that dr ito responds to her is well she's gonna do it i guess i'll just help and it's like that's what you want in reality you know you want your parents to be uh supportive of your decisions and, and the like but at the same time there's no conversation about it really it's it's i want this no i want this no fucking i want it whatever um it's a spoiled rotten fucking kid and <clears throat> While we all want that, we shouldn't want to relate to that as a character on screen. You know, um, I was watching, I was browsing Imgur, it was like around last week. I, I do it every day, a couple hours a day sometimes, depends. And the movie Falling Down was clipped at one point and you know it's Michael Douglas and he goes into a McDonald's or something akin to a McDonald's fast food restaurant of some kind and he's having a really bad day and <clears throat> he just lost his job as a government contractor and so many other factors and blah 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 and they get his order wrong and he snaps and he brings a gun and he didn't kill anybody that I'm aware of but, you know, he threatens the shit out of her. He's committing domestic fucking terrorism. And people in the comments had, you know, some things to say about it. People were like, oh, man, this is such a great film. It's so underrated. And people were like, it's not fucking underrated. People love the shit out of this film, blah, blah, And then there was another conversation that happened deeper into the comments that I hadn't expected. And it was talking about how he was basically just a spoiled asshole throwing a tantrum. And nobody should really find this to be a redeemable film. And somebody had posted a video from uh, someone, you know, using not just that, but others, um, uh, you know, other films. And it's like, <clears throat> I can't remember the exact title, but... It was a sociological breakdown of the films that white male terrorists really like. And other people were like, well, you know, white man bad. You know, this is a 36 minute video about a white man bad or whatever. And I'm like, really? I'm gonna go ahead and watch part of it and see what happens. I end up watching the whole thing. It's a really good breakdown of 
not only the nature of that film, but so many other films, <clears throat> and why they are, if you will, the uh, the escapism of these types of men who have committed heinous crimes, be it, you know, one form of terrorism or another. And he even mentions that in Falling Down, he's basically a fucking Karen. And when he said that, I was like, holy shit, he fucking is. And I liked the film. I resonated with it. But I gained a further understanding through that breakdown of not just the films, but of the sociological associations. And he even mentions, really, and it was really important that he mentioned this, he said that media doesn't influence their behaviors. It's basically that they gravitate towards these stories. You know, Joker fucking hates Joker. Um, I mean, I get it. At the same time, just if you think about it just in a cinematic sense and not a sociological sense, it's a great film. Um, there's some elements to it, of course, with the plot holes and shit and you know some of the twists and turns that seem a little bit obvious, but nevertheless, it's still, cinematically speaking, pretty good film. Um, is it sociologically a good idea? I don't know. It doesn't... Again, it's not about, it's a good film sociologically because it creates controversy, in my opinion. Because people will gravitate towards it, because people will clutch their pearls and be angry about it. Um, <clears throat> and that, I mean, was it, look at, I think it was Split? With uh, James McAvoy? And he's, you know, got like 30 fucking personalities or whatever. And there's people out there who are like, who have disassociative identity disorder or, you know, who understand it. And they're like, this is just a terrible way to present this. And I'm like, it's a fucking film for one. It's not a documentary. It's a dramatization of something. It is an exaggeration. It is hyperbole. That is what most film is. Um, I mean, it's in this world of magic, basically. It's in the unbreakable cinematic universe. Where Bruce Willis is Superman and has, you know, a kryptonite of water. Because apparently he's, like, super dense or something. I don't fucking know. Um... You know, it's like, you have to take it within the context of what you're being presented. That said, I also understand these issues. And it's good that it creates these discussions. It's good that it creates a sociological, a wider discussion, instead of just about the film, and instead, it talks more about the representation of the film. That's a different discussion, though, as well. Um, you know, use if you're only talking about the film, and you're you're saying that the film does black X, Y, and Z, and you know, to society, you're talking about it wrong. It should be an example. about a different discussion, essentially. If you're trying to say, this movie does not represent this mental health, or this thing, or that other thing, or this sociological issue this way, and that's your only talking point, you're really actually approaching it the wrong way. Because... more than 99% of the time, the purpose of a film is to entertain. While there may be some social, uh, you know, societal, you know, sociopolitical commentary within the film, that's not the only point of the fucking film. The point of the film is to entertain. 
That is the nature of film. Unless otherwise depicted or, you know, said by directors, whatever, like, Raging Bull, not a very entertaining film. At least not for me. But as an art piece, that's different. It, you know, same thing with uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. Terrible film when it comes to the concept of entertainment, but as a piece of artwork, that's different. And it is a good piece of artwork when it comes to breaking down the concepts of what the film is with regards to shot composition and color and editing and music and score, which is the same um, as sound design and so many other factors. You know, when you have all of those things, you're talking about the technical aspects of a film as a piece of artwork and even incorporating the technical artistic skills of the actors to be able to portray things a certain way and a story to be told a certain way, that's a different conversation. But, and I would say this kind of goes back to what I was saying about myself earlier. The average person isn't going to understand that. Now, I'm not trying to say, you know, I'm not trying to be all hoity-toity and snooty and shit. Um, I'm, I'm getting back to the, that point about myself where I didn't have a proper understanding of how to discuss film the way that I wanted to. I am learning that process now. I'm looking at films that I like or I don't like and I'm trying to figure out why. Beyond just a knee-jerk reaction. Beyond just a, well, I, I liked it. It's the same reason why you might say you like, you know, a specific, you know, a spaghetti sauce. Or, you know, other types of food. There, there's more to it. It's not to say that those things are more important. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm getting at is, if you wish to understand something further, if you feel that you cannot convey why you like a thing or why you dislike a thing adequately enough it's acceptable and encouraged I would say to seek out further understanding of those things let me get my charger real quick Pretty sure. I think it was about half on the charge. Well, it's only been 30 minutes, so it's not too bad. But... Internal fan in here now. Starting to feel the heat. Feel the heat. Um that's why I've been doing what I've been doing. Like when I came to LA, rather before I came to LA, I wanted a better understanding of film, of cinema. You know, I was taking um, electronics class, and then I started taking a camera class, and <clears throat> I started learning more about, you know, just the equipment in itself. And I did well in both of those classes. Um, I ended up dropping the camera class just because it was 
the middle of the semester when I decided to leave Texas. But, you know, it was like, I learned a lot. And I learned more when I took more film classes out here. Um, you know, film slash TV, because a lot of it is, there's a lot of overlap, of course. Um, and I don't know what my end goal is. I really don't. You know, understanding art is a thing that I've never really had a good grasp on. And it's always been something I've appreciated. And so instead of just taking an art appreciation class, which I mean, I guess is probably an easier method, it's probably not gonna be sufficient for me. I need more. I need a better understanding of things. And in so doing, I have a more thorough understanding of why I look at, like a certain thing. Now sure, sometimes it's difficult for me to break it down um, because I haven't had regular conversations, I haven't had the regular um, breakdowns, in, you know, like sort of the classroom environment type situations, but you know, it's just like, it, it's not a day-to-day -day thing in my life. Um, like it was when I was taking acting classes, you know, it was more day to day because it was more every day in some way or another. And, you know, because I was trying to memorize lines and I was trying to understand these characters and I was, you know, and, and doing so when you try to understand the character, it makes it easier to memorize the lines. Um, you know, and that's something that I had never understood. Like I didn't know that until I took the classes. So that's something that if you are an actor or if you thought I have such a shitty memory, there's no way I could ever, you know, memorize nearly as much. You have to understand your character. Because if you do understand your character, it's much easier. It's so much easier to memorize those lines. Like, here's a for instance, okay? The first semester that I took any acting classes, I ended up taking two. And the first one, the one of them, I didn't realize was an acting class. It was voice and movement for the performer. I thought it was just kind of like an exercise class. And in a lot of ways it was. Um, because like the first half of the class, we were basically just doing stretches and shit. Um, you know, a lot of yoga-esque type behavior without, you know, going into full on yoga. Um, Oops, got a little too vigorous there. Don't know what they are. I'll find them in a second. Anyway, um, and so there was a lot of acting that was involved in this class that I wasn't expecting. Um, one, two, three. I hope it's all the pieces that were there. I can't even get the, the broom in between the countertop and the oven. But it's whatever. So, I took this class, and again, oh, there's another one.
it was the first time I'd taken any acting classes, and it only took two. And then, towards the end of the semester, I was, I was put in Romeo and Juliet. And I'm only just learning how to understand this whole process. And so for me, it's really difficult to try to memorize all this stuff. And I've got to memorize stuff for my actual classes, for, for my actual acting class, and then for the voice and movement class. And then i got to start memorizing stuff for the fucking play. And the play, I'm playing Friar Lawrence, and it's so much content. And it, like, he has, he speaks in the most strict iambic pentameter. Whereas a lot of people, uh, you know, especially like other characters, they speak in prose. And it's a whole Shakespearean thing where there's if you will, societal differences in how people speak and all that. And being a priest, he is effectively um, the upper echelons of society. Uh, that was the way that, you know, the church was the top of society in so many ways. You know, you had the church, then you had the royalty, and then you had, you know, there's so on and so on. Um, uh, and so, what I'm getting at though is, is like, I had a harder time with my acting class and the, uh, the actual play itself. And I did have a difficult time for my uh, voice and movement class. But for our final, we had to do this one specific uh, monologue right and I was trying and I was trying so hard and I was getting it but then I wasn't and the thing was is that you just had to do an action of some kind you know and I hadn't really thought of what like again I hadn't been doing acting um you know I hadn't been an actor or hadn't been one of those kids who was like in plays in you know elementary school and stuff I was in like one once and I was the only person who tried to memorize their lines um, and literally the night before, I changed up what I was doing. And I created this entire story in my head through action. It made me memorize it. It helped. I gave this, like... I gave effectively metaphor to everything that was said in this in this monologue, a story for a character. Most people, like one girl was like, she brought in some, you know, like an outfit and props so she could basically be, you know, a, a maid. And I just want to say, I wish I had thought of that. <laughs> I wish I had thought of something like that because I didn't really figure out what the actual fucking assignment was. I didn't truly know until I saw other people doing it. One, she was just getting ready to go on stage and she was, you know, and she's just doing all these various actions and getting herself ready and all this. I'm creating a fucking story through my body. I'm, I, there's a dude who ends up like fucking, he's shooting up and stuff and stealing from people and goes to jail and um, then he gets, you know, he ends up working the food line and works at a restaurant stuff at the end of it. It's ridiculous. It's this whole fucking story. And it was totally unnecessary. I just want to say that. It was, to what I did was totally unnecessary. It was, it was more than what was necessary. But when I started thinking about it, and when I started connecting the lines to it all, it became easier for me, for me to memorize it. And then I spent two or three hours before just kind of running over it, basic actions, basic prop related things. And I just used, you know, I mostly just pantomimed the majority of it. I had a little bit of props, but not much. And I ended up having to go first. It was just a random, like, it was literally a drawing. Um, and she's like, this is what's gonna happen. I'm gonna draw one name out of a hat. 
and then we're gonna go alphabetical after that. So it didn't matter where you were, whoever you were behind, typically you were gonna go after anyway. My last name's Bandy. <laughs> I'm just happy that it was random instead of just straight up, because I was like one of the first people on the list because of my last name. I just happened to be the first fucking person to go. And that fucking killed me when I, I was like, oh shit. I did not want to go first. I didn't even want to go. <laughs> and this was like, literally, I want to say, if I'm not mistaken, because the first, see we did Romeo and Juliet twice. We did it once um, in our smaller stage and I, I hadn't, I wasn't expecting us to do it ever again. But then there was some sort of, you know, the sort of like school, college, political mix up type thing that was going on. Um, in the art department, you know, drama in the drama department. And so they had an opening for the winter semester because it was supposed to have been another professor in another play, but for whatever reason, again, through the, the drama in the drama department, it didn't go through. And so my the Romeo and Juliet director, who was also my acting teacher for the first acting class, um, she just starts calling everybody. And she's just like, "We need to do this." Um, and I'm like, "All right, I guess whatever." Um, but I think in the first, if I'm not mistaken, that final exam day, if you will for the voice and movement class was like literally this one of the same days that we had to do the play on. Cause we had to do them three, we were doing them three days in a row. We did have Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And that class was, I believe Tuesday and Thursdays. I can't remember. Um, and that class ended at like, I want to say like 3 p.m. And I think the play started at 7 p.m. <laughs> something like that. It, it was something, it was a thing like that where there was a lot of, you know, not exactly overlap, but there was a lot of crunch time between. Uh, so there was the play the night before and then you have to do the, the class and blah, 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 and this and that. Uh, so yeah. That was... Uh, it was a rough couple of days and it was a rough, it was a rough semester, but I mean, I ended up taking two more semesters of acting classes and then I spent money in fucking, um, improv and everything. So I mean, it woke something up in me, but, um, but yeah, the, the whole point of that was like, I, despite the fact that I effectively misunderstood the assignment the only way for me to truly understand the words was putting action to the words. Um, and I broke it down sentence by sentence, action by action. And that's how I was able to memorize. And we all memorize things differently with regards to, you know, plays and, and the like. but. That is the best way. Not, not saying that my way was the best way. The best way is for you to understand your character. Understand the actions that they're going to take. Understand, and you have to have a full understanding of the script, usually, to truly get what your character is, especially if you're a main character, or even if you're a supporting character that's going to be there pretty often. <clears throat> And Shakespeare is always an ensemble. Um, it's it's never just one main character. I mean, yes, there's always a main character, but who is going to be in 90% of the scenes, 
but there's going to be a lot of other people who are going to be in scenes with them or even off, you know, in scenes without that person. And generally speaking, if it's not the main character, it's the other main character. If the main, if the one main character is not on a scene, on screen, so. Um, and I was regularly on, on the, on the stage with Romeo and Juliet. Um, so, you know, it was a thing that I had to, and I didn't truly fully understand. I didn't, you know. Now, people appreciated my performance, especially people who were big Shakespeare buffs, and they're like, dude, I totally understood what you were saying. And I'm like, I'm surprised I understood. <laughs> and that's another thing, too. It's like, just because you're saying the words does not necessarily mean that you're conveying the thought, the intent of what the words mean. Um, and... Your actions help to clarify that. That's why I learned to appreciate it. I don't know how much more I'll be able to to do when it comes to acting, if if anything. But you know, I learned a good chunk. Um, I may just have to move on. I don't know. I don't know what my future holds. You know, I've got two responses yesterday from. I could put in like seven applications on Indeed yesterday, and I got two responses. One wants to schedule an appointment, one wants to do it through email conversations and stuff, so I don't know when the fuck they're going to call. I told them I was free today afternoon, and it is approaching 11.30, so we'll see what happens then. But, we'll see. And I mean, you know, Working to be able to do the thing that you want to do out in life is the better way to approach it. But if you ain't getting paid well enough, can you do anything you want to do? I don't know. But I'm going to download Johnny Five and download Short Circuit so I can watch that too. So have fun. <laughs>